Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Can everyone hear me okay? I think you can. Fantastic. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues here and our esteemed president, Melvin Lindsay, we welcome you to our presentation this afternoon for you to hear more about Amerigroup, uh, who we are, what we do. And um, at the end of our presentation, we will open the floor for questions if there are any. And one other item, uh, please, please, please remember to complete your survey. Very, very important. We want your feedback. We want to hear from you. Um, you know, if there's something you heard today that you want more information on, there's something we can do differently, um, just let us know. We're here for you. And so we'll go ahead and get started. So Amira Group's mission and objectives, we are focused on achieving health and wellness for the entire family. And we engage and support members and their families to set goals based on what is important to them, building on their strengths and enhancing each person's resiliency. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our provider engagement, and I failed to introduce myself at the very beginning, so I will do so now. My name is Vivian Scott. I'm the Director of Provider Relationship Account Management for Mirror Group Georgia, and I manage the provider relations team. So becoming a provider with Amera Group. Um, is quite simple. Uh, we've we've uh, created an automated process for providers who are interested in joining our network. And these are for brand new providers who do not participate or currently have an existing contract with us. So if you are brand new approved Medicaid provider and you've been CBO credentialed, then you are eligible to contract with us as, as a CMO for those services that are covered for those members under the CMO. So reaching us is very easy. You go to our website, which you see the link here. You select the appropriate provider type, which is currently limited to ancillary allied health and professional providers. And there's some information here to let you know which of those ancillary and allied health providers are able to utilize um, this process through, avail through our availability portal. When you click this link, and you will have a radio button where you'll be able to select your type. And again, a reminder, this is for brand new, uncontracted, not participating under an existing agreement, professional or ancillary and allied health providers. If you are a facility provider, or if you are a larger organization, such as an IPA or PHO, and you're brand new in the state of Georgia, and you're looking to uh, obtain a contract with us, that is a different process. You can still access that process through this link, but you will not go through availability, and there's more details on that on the actual landing page on how you can accomplish that. Uh, once you go into availability, you will select your payer spaces and follow the prompts that are listed here. And again, all of this information is on our website and it will also be in the presentation that will be posted on um, by DCH. If you do not have an availability account, then you can create an account with availability. And, and I encourage you to do so if you're going to become a new provider with us because there is a wealth of information and tools that are supported through availability, such as you can check member eligibility, you can submit claims directly to us, you can attach records if you need to, medical records, um, primary EOBs, you can track various things in there. And when you um, complete your provider agreement through this process, you can also track the status of that agreement up to completion. And you will receive that, that contract once it's executed by Amir Group, you will get your effective date and you will receive your contract back via email. If you are a provider new to Georgia Medicaid or new to the group that you're in, 
but you're joining uh, a group that is existing and contracted with us already and participates in our network, then you don't need to do anything. We receive information from the state on a daily basis, and we do auto loads for providers that have been credentialed under an existing participating tax ID number. If for some reason there's an error and, and you're, you're, you don't see yourself loaded within 30 days, um, and you can always check that status by going out and looking in our provider directory to see if you're listed. But if you don't see yourself listed, then feel free to please call your local provider representative. And I will give you more information on how you can locate that representative further on in the presentation. So I mentioned credentialing and recredentialing or credentialing just a few minutes ago, but I just want to highlight that a mayor group, of course, um, participates and follows the requirements of the Department of Community Health for credentialing and recredentialing. So any in order for a provider to be eligible to contract with us, they in addition to having an eligible Medicaid ID for the services you are looking to render, you must also be credentialed through the state before you would be eligible to contract with us. Once you are an eligible contracted provider, every three years, DCH will notify you or rather their credentialing verification organization will contact you and make you aware that you are due for recredentialing, which occurs every three years. It is critical that you follow and, and submit your application because failure to do so could result in your credentialing status becoming inactive, which will then affect your participation with Amira Group. You must maintain credentialing in order to be eligible as an active participating provider in our network. I also want to point out, and I had mentioned it a little bit earlier, there is an exception for us as it relates to credentialing and recredentialing, and that's those instances where it is a much larger system that we have entered into what we call a delegated credentialing agreement with. We do this with large um, hospital and physician organizations or independent physician associations. And so those providers do not typically go through the state's CBO. They perform their own credentialing, and that information is provided to us via roster. All right, I want to talk a little bit about how we partner um, as an organization, and particularly from the provider relation perspective. And we have many ways that we get out and engage in the community with our providers and not just our providers, but also those professional associations that support certain provider specialties. And so here's just a few examples of how we uh, go out and we engage. We participate and support uh, various associations and their annual conferences. For some of our larger organizations and key providers, we have ongoing joint operations committee meetings. We conduct education forums and town halls. And we also do face-to-face -face visits. Every field representative with the Mara Group on the provider relations team has an assigned territory, and they go out and visit with their providers that are in that are in that territory. And each one of them is required to perform a minimum of 30 face-to-face -face visits per month. Okay, so I want to give you just a little bit of information about something we're very, very proud of, and that's our Provider Training Academy. We established this as a way to help providers with continuing education credits, but also to have a focus on certain topics that we feel are very, very important to help providers to better care for our members. Um, one of the big things that we focus on right now is cultural competency. And we have a suite of presentations out there around cultural, cons cultural competency and diversity in caring for your members and your practice. In addition to that, our Provider Pathways e-learning site 
provides 24 seven education resources for providers so that they can go out and take these courses on their, at their own leisure. It's, it's self-paced. Um, you can, some of these you are required to register for, particularly those that um, will issue um, continuing education credits. But there are others that you do not even have to be a participating provider with the mayor group in order to access these trainings. So I certainly, uh, for those of you that are in medical organizations and practices, I encourage you to go out and peruse our site and certainly pass that information on to your physicians and other key clinical staff that some of these courses and credits may be applicable and could be a benefit. Um, this is just giving you a list of some of the things that are available on our website, uh, our provider tools and resources, and I won't go into them. I mean, they're demonstrated here, but as you can see, there is a wealth of information and we encourage providers to go out and look at these tools and resources. If at any time a provider um, has gone out and you've seen something and you have questions or you may want more in-depth training for your staff in your practice, reach out to your local provider representative. We are more than happy to come on site and arrange those types of teachings. And lastly, how to stay connected with us. We have multiple ways in which you can reach the network team. The first is our toll-free number, which actually goes to a national call center. So when you call this number, you are speaking with a team of representatives that can answer questions regarding claims, prior authorizations, payment disputes, appeals, grievances, just a, a number of things. But if you're looking to get in touch with your local representative and you're not sure who that individual may be, we actually post our network resources document on our provider web portal. And that link is here and it's on our contact us landing page. In addition, we offer email um, as an alternative to reach out to our team. And when we receive these emails, we have um, a group of people who man these emails every single day and assign them to the appropriate representative and that representative has 24 hours to respond to the provider. And that team is also looking to see if those responses are being set timely. And if not, that associate receives a reminder and I'm copied in on. So I too am aware if someone is not responding timely. And then lastly, stay connected with us on updates. I, I, I'm very, very sensitive to the fact that Provider offices receive a multitude of communications from payers in the state of Georgia. And Amera Group is no exception. We send out lots of information. We want you to be informed. However, if at any time you think you saw something or you're curious about whether or not we have a collateral or some information posted, we actually have an archive on our website. You can type in a search on a topic and see if anything comes up. If for some reason you do not see anything, please email your provider or representative so that we can confirm for you that you know, there's no information published, but then we'll be more than happy to direct you to where you can find it, or we will get that information for you. And next, I'm going to give just a very, very brief uh, overview about claims and claim submissions. Um, so submitting a claim to Amerigroup um, is pretty straightforward, and we offer several options for providers to do that. Uh, they can submit to us electronically. They can utilize their own um, clearing houses or, or tools that they use. But in addition, we also provide um, a way for providers to submit claims to us, and that's through our Availability Essentials portal. The other alternative, of course, is paper. And, you know, we certainly will accept a paper claim. Um, we encourage providers to um, use an electronic avenue to submit their claims just because of the tracking capability that it provides for them. It gives you a lot of information in the event 
the claim doesn't go through and rejects. You get that information much quicker than if you send us a paper claim and we've got to send you back a letter. And we certainly don't want providers to miss the opportunity to get their claims to us timely. Um, now I'm just going to give you a little bit of information about coordination of benefits. And interestingly enough, we had quite a few questions today about that at our table. Um, and we were happy to answer that. And we, and we understand why it can be confusing. But I guess to put it most simply, how we manage coordination of benefits is not much dissimilar to other payers. And that's simply being that as the secondary payer, we will never remit reimbursement higher than what we would have paid as the primary payer. And so here I have a couple of scenarios that um, hopefully will clear this up. And for those of you who visited our table today that had some issues, and we've already discussed it and we're gonna work on getting those corrected for you. But this is generally how we manage a coordination of benefit claim. So the first example shows you where the other health insurance made a payment of $125 and the member had zero liability, meaning they had no deductible, no coinsurance and no copay from their commercial payer. Amerigroup's fee schedule for the bill service is $200. Therefore, when we receive that secondary claim because the primary only paid $125, there was no member liability, a mirror group will remit $75. The second scenario is to demonstrate when the member has a liability and how that calculation should occur. Again, $125 paid for the, by the service, which was the, their allowable. It's not just the payment, it is the allowable. In this scenario, the member had a responsibility of $50. Our allowable again was $200. So in this scenario, Amerigroup's payment will be $50. Appealing a claim uh, is, is also very easy with Amerigroup and we have several options in which you can do that. And if you want more detailed information, please visit our provider web portal and go to our provider manual. We have a very detailed section around appealing a claim or filing a payment dispute or reconsideration. But the three ways or the three levels, I will say, that you can submit that um, reconsideration or appeal. And the first level is what we consider the reconsideration. The majority of claims that we re receive that are disputed are resolved at this level because we're usually able to tell the provider in detail why we denied the claim. If the provider still disagrees once they receive that response, they have a second level appeal opportunity and more detailed information is available in our provider manual. If after your second level appeal, there's still disagreement, or, or dissatisfaction with our decision, the state, um, or I should say supported by the state, is a third level process. And that regulatory complaint process is detailed along with the timeframes and how you perform this in our provider manual. In addition, you can appeal a claim through multiple avenues. You can call our, our national call center at this toll-free number. As I mentioned earlier, you can use our availability essentials portal to submit an appeal to a claim. And then lastly, you may mail that dispute to us along with any supporting documents. And let me also make note that when you submit through availability, you have the ability and do not forget to attach your supporting documentation. That is critical for the reviewer to understand why you are having a concern around our decision. That uh, concludes my presentation. And now I will turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Ms. Robles, who will talk to you about our value-based programs. Oh, 
Hello, good afternoon. Can y'all hear me okay? First of all, thank you all so much for sticking and hanging in there with us. We know it's pretty late in the day um, and you've gotten a lot of valuable information um, throughout the day. So we do appreciate you staying for this. Um, my name is Mary Robles and I'm the Provider Collaboration Programs Director here with Amerigroup. And essentially that's a long title to say that I work with value-based programming, um, which is what I'm, I have the pleasure of speaking with you all about today. So similar to what you heard or the messaging that you heard this morning in regards to our desire to improve access as well as improve quality of work, um, we have established, or actually we've committed to redefining healthcare by establishing some value-based programs. These programs incentivize our providers for, for doing the quality of work that they do, which we hope will subsequently assist in expanding the capacity of the work and the access to our members. Um, I've also served as a provider in the state of Georgia, so I know that sometimes we walk that fine line between what we are able to provide in terms of capacity and still maintain the same level of quality um, that we want to for our members, because it ends up being a win-win for all of us. When we have the ability to provide the care and quality care, we also improve our members moving along that continuum. We ensure that they are improving the appropriate use of benefit utilization, and then at the end of the day, we're going to see those improved member health outcomes, which is the goal that we all share. Um, one of the ways that we collaborate in terms of doing that is working with our providers with these specific value-based programs. And you see on the screen right now, those are a few of the examples of programs that we currently have within the state of Georgia. And I'm happy to say that in 2022, we haven't finalized our numbers for 2023, but in 2022, we were able to pay our Georgia providers an additional $10 million for those, um, based on those that were participating in these programs. Additionally, we saw a substantial improvement in terms of outcome um, when comparing those providers participating in value-based programs versus those who were not participating in the value-based programs. I'm not gonna go into detail about each one, each one of the programs, because there are criteria associated with provider type um, as well as attribution. But I do want to speak with all of you regarding our social drivers of health provider incentive program, because all providers who are in good standing with our organization are eligible to participate in that program. And when we're looking at whole health in general, as it relates to the folks that we serve, we want to make sure that we are meeting basic needs so that they'll focus on their health needs. And so with this particular program, it's kind of unique, number one, in the fact that all providers who are in good standing can participate. Number two, a lot of the um, measures for these particular programs it, are excluded from each other. So you can do a part of the program and still earn an incentive versus one relying on another. And so with this program in particular, what we look at is we want our providers to assess our members for those needs. What are those um, social determinants of health that may be impacting their care? We also have a second process that it's optional. Like I said, they're kind of exclusive where we like our providers to look at those adverse childhood experiences so that we can get a baseline and collaborate with the providers um, to ensure that we are addressing those needs for the members as well. And then once those assessments are complete, if, if a need has been identified and a provider bills a Z code, they will earn an additional incentive. So you get one for completing the assessment, one for billing a Z code. After that, if you've made a referral to a CBO, so one of those community-based organizations, you can earn an incentive for that with our overall goal being to close the loop not just making the referral, but following up with our members to ensure that they did get the service or the, the, their need met um, so that we can help them along that continuum. So those are just some of the opportunities that we have available at Amerigroup as it relates to our value-based programs. Um, you'll, you'll get a copy of this as well, but if you are interested in any of the programs or you want to learn more to see if maybe you qualify for participation, we do have the contact information for those who are overseeing those particular programs on this slide. Thank you, and I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Bailey to speak with you all about mental health parity.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Bailey. I am the manager for the Behavioral Health Utilization Management Team with Amerigroup, and I'm going to talk to you briefly about mental health parity. I know you guys have heard it from the other CMOs, and some of you probably went out to went to the breakout as well, so we won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, the House Bill 1013 at Georgia Mental Health Parity Act was signed April 4th, 2022. It's the most important piece of behavioral health legislation in, in Georgia in recent memory. There are six major sections of the Mental Health Parity um, Act. Behavioral health parity in private insurance and Medicaid is one that we'll talk about a little bit further. So with Amerigroup, um, we do provide mental health coverage and substance abuse at the same level as any physical health service. We also do not prohibit any same day reimbursement for a member who sees a mental health provider and a PCP in the same day. And we provide an annual um, parity comparative report to DCH. DCH also had a has established a process for addressing any kind of complaints about mental health parity, and they make reasonable efforts to provide clinically or culturally, linguistically appropriate materials to consumers to navigate that complaint process. This is just a little screenshot of the website for the complaint um, site. And now I am going to actually talk to you about the behavioral health part of prior authorizations. So for behavioral health, we do have several services that require prior authorization. For our inpatient and higher levels of care, those include partial hospitalization, IOP, um, residential services or PRTF, acute inpatient psychiatric admissions, and our crisis stabilization units. For our outpatient services, all of our core services and psychological testing do require prior authorization. We have a few codes that you will get as a provider uh, units up front. Those include the H0031 and 32, which you get 16 units every year per provider per member per year. Um, once those 16 units are used up, then you will re be required to submit a prior authorization request. If you complete trauma assessments, which is the H0031 with the TJ, TJ modifier, those do not require any uh, prior, prior authorization and do not have a limit on units. Our individual family and group therapy codes also get 20 sessions at the beginning of each calendar year per provider per um, member. Um, once you have used those 20 sessions, then you'll submit a prior authorization request for any further services. The two websites that we use, Availity and Gamus, um, are where all of your prior authorizations are submitted. For Availity, that includes our psych testing, IOP, PHP, and our higher levels of care, the inpatient and PRTF services. With Gamus, um, all of our outpatient behavioral health services are submitted there, and it's another place to submit psych, uh, PRTF, our residential treatment requests as well. As far as the PRTF process, um, all of our services that are submitted have a time frame in which we have to make a decision. So for anything that's expedited, and that can include our acute inpatient CSU um, admissions and our PRTF continued stay, we make decisions on those once we receive the reviews within 24 hours. For our initial or standard services, um, which include our initial PRTF request, PHP, IOP, and our traditional and core outpatient services. We have three business days to complete those. We do our best to try and get those done before that third business day. So you guys can start services a lot quicker. When submitting an inpatient service request, um, these are just a few things that we ask that you guys make sure to include on the template when you're submitting it, is just making sure to complete that template thoroughly and upload it with the request online to include any pertinent information, symptoms, behaviors that would warrant that admission or continued stay, and definitely include dates of interventions um, and dates of medication changes. That gives us a good timeline of how the treatment is progressing. Um, and of course, discharge planning, probably one of the most important things with our um, members when they do admit is knowing what's going to happen when they discharge. 
So that starts at admission. Um, and we do want to see on those request forms, the plan, the recommendations, and if there's any barriers. For our outpatient services, the prior authorization request form is on GAMIS. Um, it's a template, very easy to fill out. Again, making sure to include any pertinent clinical information, symptoms, behaviors, only requesting the number of units that are noted on the treatment plan. Don't over request units. Um, you can submit sooner for services if you've used all the units already. Um, we have no problem with that <laughs> and authorizing and just making sure to include specific goals and objectives that are going to be worked on during that authorization period as well. If you're submitting a continued stay request or a concurrent review, um, include the progress that the members made barriers if there's not been a lot of progress and any changes in the goals or objectives that they may have um, may have been made for that treatment plan. And then as far as optimizing our outpatient service requests, these are some of the big things that we run into um, where we have members who have multiple providers. If you're a new member, or if your member's new to you, find out if they have or had another provider if that provider has an authorization on file, we want to know that you are their new preferred provider. So they can sign a little note. You can have a form that's submitted with that um, prior authorization request, just indicating that you actually you are the preferred provider for that member. This actually helps avoid any unnecessary denials for duplicate requests or overlapping services. If there are multiple providers and a member does need to see somebody in addition to you, just clearly note that on the GAMMA's comment section and let us know why the member is seeing another provider. It could be due to a specialty program that that provider has that you don't do, you don't provide or something like that as far as a transition. And then lastly, um, if you're doing medication management only, but your organization requires that the member receive another, another service, when you request that other service, ensure that the units you're requesting is appropriate for what you're going to be doing. Don't over request your units. Um, again, if you run out, we can reauthorize <laughs> prior to that six month um, deadline. All right, and now I'm gonna pass it on to Kristen to talk about pharmacy. I went backwards. Hi, my name is Kristen Leiner. Uh, I am a member of the pharmacy team. I am Georgia Family 360's pharmacy technician, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about pharmacy prior authorizations. So there are three ways that we can have a prior authorization submitted. The first one and probably the quickest one is to do it electronically. Uh, you can do this through Cover My Meds or an electronic health record system. You can also submit a request through fax. There are two different fax numbers, one for pharmacy benefit, one for medical benefit. And if neither of those options are preferred for you, you can also call the provider services number to reach the call center for PAs. Our PAs are processed within 24 hours, and if a member is in need of their medication before those 24 hours are up, uh, network pharmacies are authorized to dispense 72-hour emergency supplies, and those emergency supplies can be processed through Amerigroup so that there is no charge to them. If a prior authorization is denied, there is a peer-to-peer -peer review process that can be used. The peer-to-peer the -peer reviews can only be requested by phone, um, and there is a time limit of 30 days from the, when the denial is received, and this can't be initiated once an appeal has been started. So we do ask that the peer-to-peer -peer review requests be done prior to any appeals being started so that we can get the most out of the process for you. 
and we have a few tools available to help expedite the PA process for everyone. There is always the option to check a benefit in real time. This is easily accessed through EHRs at the point of care, and this can help quickly determine coverage or find alternatives if there is an issue with coverage there. There's also a provider lookup and tools online system called Pluto. This is easily accessible through the provider website, and this is used for things like medical injectables, and it works based off of the J codes, and you can find all the PA requirements needed there. We also have automatic prior authorizations or smart PAs. Nothing has to be done on the provider side for these to work. These are using automated logics built into the system at point of sale. And if all requirements are met, a PA requirement will not happen to cause any issues. This bypasses all the needs there and the pharmacy will be able to process the prescription easily and everything will move on slow quickly for everything. And then we also have the electronic prior authorizations, the EPAs. These are again accessible online in the EHRs and in Cover My Meds. These are the quickest way. Honestly, you can get approval within minutes. And this also gives a wonderful option for prior authorizations that have already been completed. It allows the ability to renew the prior authorization without having to do a whole new one when it's time when that authorization has reached its end. Thank you. And I will now pass it over to Abraham. Good afternoon. My name is Ibrahim and I am the manager for Outpatient UM. And today I'll be talking about our prior authorization process for physical health, both inpatient and outpatient. Um, and even though I cover outpatient, but I'll speak to both of them. So prior authorizations, we all know um, that the source of truth is GAMIS. We want providers to utilize GAMIS, which is the centralized portal um, owned by the state, by DCH. But you also have the option to use Ability, which is our own, own a mail group own internal portal. You can also request authorizations uh, through Ability. And uh, we have a lot of information about the prior authorization process um, on our provider website we can give you more detailed information. But basically what you want to remember is that authorizations can be requested through GAMIS or through Ability, and we try to make it paperless as electronic as possible, avoid faxes um, so that it's easy to track and information can be processed um, as fast as possible. And again, we do know that a lot of services do require prior authorizations. And some of them here you would see your DMEs. I'm sure we all know by now that DMEs do require, not all of them, but some of them do require prior authorizations. If you want home health services, pain management, all inpatient admissions do require prior authorizations. Um, if you need PT, OT, speech, all of those services do require prior authorizations as well. Um, and again, you can utilize Pluto, which is the pre-certification lookup tool. It tells you what could require prior authorization and what codes do not require prior authorization. So that in that way, you won't have to worry about submitting a code in GAMIS or Ability that do not require prior authorization. You can pretty much know that, okay, I can provide this service without a prior authorization or I cannot provide this service without an authorization. So it's a very useful tool that you can find on our provider website to be able to um, determine what codes will need prior authorization. So turnaround times, typically for a standard prior authorization, uh, we have three business days to process the authorization. If it is expedited, and expedited means life or limb threatening, or putting the member or patient at risk, 
Um, so that is 24 hours from the time we receive the authorization. And for inpatient admissions, um, we need, we would prefer that the provider notify us within 24 hours and attack the clinicals as well for, for, the, uh, for us to be able to review uh, the inpatient admissions. And again, um, with the turnaround times, because it's very tight, three business days, you don't have to wait for a fax or for a phone call. You can go on the portal. Our prior authorization platform is very cutting edge and or we have a very almost real time updates from our platform to GAMS. So every 15 minutes, whatever changes we make in our platform updates into GAMS. So you can pretty much um, have an idea or an outcome of your authorization within a short period of time. So don't wait for a fax or don't wait for, you know, for a whole week to see what the status of your authorization is. If it is a standard within three business days, you could, uh, we're processing in fact less than three business days, you can know the status of the authorization. If it is an expedited authorization within 24 hours, you can go back on GAMIS or Ability to see the outcome of your authorization. And again, if it is peer to peer, so we all know that the last thing we want is to deny a service because our goal is that members get all the services that they need. But if an authorization is denied, you do also have the opportunity to request for a peer to peer. That means that the physician can speak to our physician or if it is a PT or speech or OT, they can speak to the PT or OT reviewer and they can discuss it and see if there's any additional information or any info that you can provide to make that decision change from a denial to an approval. But again, you have two business days from the date of denial to request for a peer to peer. And again, you, can, you don't have to call it in. You don't have to send a fax. It's all electronic. We want to make it as seamless as possible. So those are the two email addresses that you can use. If it is medical, you could use that Georgia peer to peer at anthem.com and just note that the number two is not spelled out. It's just as it is. And if it is PT, OT, and sp or speech, you could use that um, uh, therapy GA at anthem.com. Again, just remember that this is only for physical health. So if you're doing BH, it's different. If you're doing pharmacy, it's different. So this is purely physical health authorizations. So approvals and denials. So just like I indicated, if an authorization is approved, you could see the status on GAMIS um, or Ability. If it is denied, you can still see, still see the status on GAMIS or Ability, but again, you will get a letter in the mail. The member will get a letter and the provider will get a letter in the mail. And it will explain why it was denied and what are the other options that you have. That means you can request for a peer-to-peer, -peer, you can request for a reconsideration, you can appeal the denial as well. So these are just some of the reasons, the common reasons why an authorization will be denied. One is lack of information. So when you submit an authorization, it's important that you attach the supporting documentation for the service you're requesting for the member. And again, we know in GAMIS, you can upload documents. In Ability, you can upload documents as well. So you don't need to do it you know, two separate times. As soon as you submit the authorization, go ahead and upload your documents as well. And again, you want to always check as a provider, you want to see if the member is eligible for service with a Mary group. Um, so eligibility is very important. And then the service that you're requesting for, is it a benefit that the member has? Because, you know, we know if it is not a benefit, more than likely that service will be disallowed. And again, you always want to check Pluto just to make sure that code that you're requesting for, does it require prior authorization or not? That helps you a lot. And also, is this a covered or a non-covered code so that you wouldn't have to worry about submitting an auth if it's not a service that's not covered? So these are just some helpful tips to make sure that authorizations are processed timely with less problems. And number one, just like I indicated, is to use that prior authorization lookup tool uh, to see if the service you want for the member require an authorization or not. Again, it's always advisable to use GAMIS or you can use Ability. Keep it electronic, no faxes. You don't have to do any phone calls. And again, uh, verify your ICD-10 codes and your procedure codes that you are requesting uh, authorization for, for the procedure codes, and make sure the ICD-10 code, ICD code is up to date. And again, um, make sure that 
clinicals are submitted or are attached to your authorization as well. Eligibility is important. We want to verify that the member is eligible for service. And um, for our inpatient admissions, again, we do request that of any discharge needs for the members so that authorization for services can be done prior to discharge. So these are some useful resources. So for physical health authorizations, we know that um, authorization decisions are not made arbitrarily. We have to follow evidence-based standard guidelines to review authorizations, and that's what determine that what help us to determine medical necessity. Um, again, the same criteria that we use to review an authorization, the providers have access to the same criteria. So you can check before you submit the authorization what constitute medical necessity for this service. What do I need to submit? So you can access. Um, all our criteria that we use for review from the provider website. It's a very transparent process. And again, if you need to contact us, you have different ways. If you prefer a phone call, you can contact our National Contact Center. You can pro, uh, contact um, through phone call our provider services. We have a voicemail for the UM team, and you can also reach us through email. So both our voicemail and the email, they are manned on a daily basis by associates throughout all our business hours. So it's a very efficient way of getting an answer or response to any concerns or any questions that you have about authorizations. So that's the end of my presentation. I'll pass it on to our GF360 team, Abby. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon. I have a lot of pressure. I know I'm the last presenter of the day. It's been a long day, so I will not take a lot of time because I want to stay on y'all's good side today. But my name is Abby Bolden. I am the business change manager with the Georgia Family 360 program. So Amerigroup Georgia has the privilege of supporting this program for the state of Georgia, in which we cover all youth in foster care, adoption assistance, and those committed to the Department of Juvenile Justice. So today I'm just going to do a brief overview of some of our key initiatives that we're really excited about and wanted to share with you all. Um, we could go into a lot more details. If you have questions, I'd be more than happy to chit chat with you after today's presentation. So the first initiative that we launched last year in partnership with Murphy Harps is called our step down home model. So we know when our young adults are in a secure facility or inpatient facility and need a transition back to the community, Sometimes that is a stark contrast um, in terms of what they're expecting, what they're expected to do, how they're expected to behave. So with our partnership with Murphy Harps, we launched two houses last year in which our young adults are able to go to a home that operates like a house parent model, and they're able to slowly transition back to their community. We're able to work, or the provider is able to work more closely with them to ensure that they're ready for that transition, and then the family that they'll be going to has time to prepare, prepare for them to come back. So again, like I said, this is newer. We're really excited that in 2023, we're going to be launching six more homes across the state of Georgia. So down in Augusta, Atlanta area, we're hoping to encompass all the regions of the state as much as we can. And one of the cool outcomes that we had of this program already is that 91% of the members that were there stayed and increased their length of stay in that placement. So that's huge. We know stability sometimes can be a struggle for some of our members. So that was a really encouraging outcome to see. And we're really excited to see the benefits that this is going to continue to bring to some of our vulnerable or most vulnerable youth. Now, another um, flag I like to wave when we have some of our education and training team here with us today is that we have our own GF360 specific education and training team. If you're here, you can raise your hand. Some of y'all are in the room. Um, so what we're comprised of both licensed and non-licensed child welfare professionals who train all across the state. This looks like anything from virtual, in person, attending conferences, and their trainings aren't just about GF360 or insurance or that, but they have really cool specific trainings based off of the needs of our child welfare population. So some of the examples that they've done is we have two of our staff certified in community resiliency, so they can come out and work with groups around that model. We offer mental health first aid, 
And then we do uh, another example is, you know, levels of care for behavioral health. So PRTF, what is that? You know, what's the criteria for it? But they also do a myriad of training. So that just scratches the surface. And the cool thing is they do on demand. So if you have something you or your staff want to know more about, some diagnosis, prescriptions, social determinants of health, truly anything that you can think of, we're more than happy to support. So we have the information on the screen with how to contact them. But as we shared, Marcus, the manager, is here today. So y'all can come chit chat with him afterwards, too. And we'd be happy to make sure we can connect our team with your teams to make sure we're working collectively to support our child welfare population. And then the last thing, just to remind everyone, this has been a program we've had for since inception, but it's our value-based purchasing program related to preventative care. So we want to work with our providers to support our members in providing this incentive. If a provider sees our members within 10 days of their eligibility for their medical, dental, or trauma assessment, they're able to get a $50 incentive per member if they do so within that 10 days of them being eligible with us. And then on an ongoing basis, the provider has the opportunity to receive a $25 incentive if they're able to support the member in getting their annual wellness check completed and their dental exam completed every six months. And last thing, just to tease um, some up and coming uh, initiative that we have is we are going to be soon launching a series where we're going to be credentialing 200 clinicians in the state of Georgia to become trauma-focused cognitive behavioral or training trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy model. So more to come with there, but just stay tuned. We're going to be blasting this out on some of our provider platforms. So if you're interested, um, we would love to hear from you so we can make sure that we stay connected when that initiative launches. And lastly, just wanted to remind everyone, if you've ever been in our trainings, you've probably heard this and are tired of hearing it, but every one of our members does have a licensed care coordinator assigned to them. So if you need help supporting the member, they need resources, you have questions about um, what they're eligible for, if you look on the screen, there's a link and a number that you can call or you can see me after too, I'm happy to share my information to make sure that we connect you with that care coordinator. Our care coordinators really are the heart of what um, GF360 does in supporting our members. So the more we can keep them connected to the services, to the providers and really work hand in hand, um, then we know that that's what's gonna be best for the state of Georgia and for our members. So that is all I have for today and we will open it up for questions. Um, this is in regards to the um, behavioral health. Um, we are uh, just getting an LSW in our facility and we're FQHC. And so we want to make sure that we are billing the, I guess, billing the claims correctly with the LSW. Does it require a modifier with the code that they utilize or can we even bill the LSW? <laughs> and and just to make sure I understood your question, what what provider type did you say you were? FQHC. Okay, so for FQHCs, all your services should be billed under the FQHC. Okay. And and you can only bill those services that are outlined in the state manual for okay. FQHCs and RHCs. Um, it should not be billed at the individual provider level. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, either you guys are really tired or we did a good job, but we'll take it either way. <laughs> so, um, again, on behalf of um, the, the leadership team at Amerigroup, and I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the rest of our team that's here today, if they'll just wave their hand. Um, if there's any information you're still seeking, um, you feel free to come to our table. We'll be there uh, for a little bit longer. 
But I just want to say thank you for your time this afternoon. We know it's been a very, very long day, and we really appreciate you coming in and letting us share some information about Amira Group. And um, we hope everyone has a great rest of your day and safe travels home. Thank you.